and with Sonar Source since 2013. I've worn a number of different hats. Um, right now I'm in marketing, but I've also been in uh, rule writing, project, product management, excuse me, um, documentation, that sort of thing. Uh, and our speaker today is going to be Tibor Blenesy. Ooh, I said that wrong. Sorry, let me try that again. <laughs> Tibor Blenishy. Uh, Blenishy. Sorry, Tibor. Um, who has been with us since 2016. Uh, he's been a languages developer that whole time. Um, those of you who were here a few minutes ago heard us talking about how Tibor has worked on the Java analyzer as well as JavaScript. Um, with some excursions into other languages. But of course, JavaScript is his true love. Um, so we'll get started in just a second. I've got a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, so I do want to say that um, Tibor will, will be joined by another of our colleagues, Yasin Kamun, um, who's been with Sonar Source for a couple of years, also on the languages development side. Um, they'll be taking questions at the end. If you have questions, go ahead and enter them through the Q&A function, not the chat, but the Q&A function in the webinar. And then we'll go through those at the end um, and answer your questions. So with that, and without further ado, Tibor, let's kick it off. Okay, so welcome everyone. And uh, to, to start this uh, presentation about um, smarter CI continuous integration slash continuous delivery pipeline with static analysis, in analysis I would like to start with a, with a poll. So, so, and the question is uh, exactly the topic of the presentation. So do you use static analysis in your continuous integration slash continuous delivery pipeline? So I've opened up the poll and we do have voting in progress here. So right now, um, SonarCube and ESLint are about neck and neck with some votes for no and seems complicated. So hopefully, Tibor, you can dispel the seems complicated and we'll yes. win over the no people today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So thanks everyone who, who voted and let's start. Um, so today on today's agenda, uh, what I would like to talk about first is what kind of bugs you can actually catch with static analysis. And after this, um, let's say a bit of theory, I would show a demo about integration with your continuous integration slash continuous delivery pipeline. And afterwards, I will show also a short demo of how you can integrate our <clears throat> tools into Visual Studio Code uh, editor. So before I start this theory part, I will just do a quick preparation for my demo because it, it, it can take a minute. So we will, we will kind of optimize the time. Oh, okay. So I will switch my screen to, to the browser. Oh. And I will log in into Sonar Cloud. So Sonar Cloud is a software as a service platform where you can do your static analysis of your, of your project. So I'm going to log in using my GitHub account. You can also use Bitbucket, GitLab or Azure DevOps account. So I'm going to log in with GitHub and I end up on, on this landing page with my projects. And I'm going to analyze uh, one project. So the project I'm going to analyze is called Strapi. This is a, a, a CMS um, platform uh, written on top of Node.js. So it's quite popular open source project. So what I did here is that I forked this project into my personal profile on GitHub because I, I don't want to interfere with the original project. So I, I, I forked the, the original project into my GitHub account and I'm going to analyze this project on Sonar Cloud. And actually it's quite simple. So I will click on analyze new project. Now I am a member of two organizations at GitHub, uh, Sonar Source, which is my employer 
and my personal organization. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to use my personal organization. Here it will show all my repositories from GitHub. So some of them are, you may notice some of them are grayed out. The reason for that is that I am going, uh, I, my private organization is not on the paid plan, so I cannot analyze private repositories, but I can analyze public repositories. So the repository I forked is called Strapi and it's here. So you might wonder why I have Strapi 2 here. So this is just in case the demo goes wrong and I still want to show you something. So please ignore that. And I'm going to click on setup now. So this will create a project which is linked to this GitHub repository. Now what's happening in the background is that we will going to check out, uh, clone your repository and start the analysis on it. It can take a few minutes, so now I will continue with my presentation. Okay, so here we are. So what actually is static analysis? So from Wikipedia, if you, if you just Google static analysis, static analysis is the analysis of code that it's done on the, on the source code without executing that source code. So this is in contrast with dynamic analysis, which is done during the pro program execution. So we are not running the program, we are just looking at the code and treating it as, as, as data. And how, how does it actually work? Like, what can you, uh, what are the, <clears throat> how do you actually implement something like static analysis? So there are different levels. So the first kind of level um, to, to do static analysis is uh, the syntax level. Something, uh, <clears throat> so we, we, we look at the source code and we build something which is called abstract syntax tree. And one rule uh, which we have to, which works on this syntax level is the rule, all branches in a conditional structure should not have exactly the same implementation. So what does, okay, I should first explain probably what the rule is. So the rule is, uh, <clears throat> the rule is um, uh, a, a check. Uh, it's a, basically it's a piece of code which, which checks some particular pattern in the code. So for example, we have, we have many rules. Uh, usually we, we, we have, uh, they, they are coded like S and uh, some, some, some number. So this is a rule S 3923. We don't really have 309,900 rules because there are some gaps in numbering. So this is just the code. So these rules detects the pattern where you have a conditional expression and both the true and the false branch are the same. So this piece of code you see on the screen is from the browser quest project. This is uh, some browser based game, as far as I understand. And inside of this project, you can find this function, which is testing if you are playing on the mobile and it should return the number of frame per seconds the game should be initialized with. And it returns the same value whether you are mobile or not. So this might have been intentional, However, it's rather suspicious because like, why would you test it if you were not interested to return something else? So you might wonder, I don't need any sophisticated analysis. I don't need any abstract syntax tree for this to work. Well, let me explain further. So this abstract syntax tree for this conditional expression, how does it look like? So you have a root node, which is conditional expression, and it consists of three child nodes. One is test, which is the test before the question mark. And then there is the consequent and alternate part. So the true and the false branch. And so what this rule does is it just takes the consequent and alternate branches and it compares if they are identical. However, this comparison is, is, is a bit smarter because it ignores white space and and it ignores uh, some, some minor syntactical uh, details like parentheses. So that's why we are talking about abstract syntax tree. This is the abstraction. We abstract from the white space and we abstract from some syntactic details. So for example, if you were to implement the, this rule with regular expression, you would be able to detect this particular pattern. 
However, you can express the same idea a bit differently. You can put a new line after the colon and you can put the, the any literal into parentheses. And uh, working on the abstract syntax tree level will allow you to detect also this pattern. And if you abstract a bit farther from the, from the implementation, it actually allows you to detect this pattern. <clears throat> So this is the kind of basic syntax tree analysis we have for, for some of our rules, which are rather simple. So if you want to go a bit further and to the next level, we are talking about semantic analysis. So semantic is, is understanding not only the syntax, but also a little bit of the meaning of the code. What I mean by that? What we see on the screen is, is a pattern where we are working with some URL string. And so first we split it by the question mark, then we split it by the hash uh, symbol. And then we are doing some replacement, but the variable is assigned in, in this um, chained assignment twice. So this is likely a mistake. There is no, that it doesn't make any sense to, to assign the, the return value of replace into the URL and then to assign that to URL again. So probably the developer intended to do something else. So to be able to detect such pattern, and by the way, uh, this snippet is coming from next uh, JS project. And to be able to detect such pattern, we need to understand that URL is not just somehow the, the token with three characters, but we, it's, it's some sort of, a, of something we, we call symbol. And to be able to, to detect that different occurrences of URL are actually pointing to the same symbol, we are maintaining something which is usually called a symbol table. So in the symbol table, we, we maintain a, a list of the declaration of variables and all the references. And you can have actually the same um, identifier multiple times in the symbol table because you can have the same variable with the same name can be declared in multiple codes and they are different variables so they will be different symbols. Okay, so if you go to the next level, we can talk about control flow analysis. So one example of control flow analysis would be the rule uh, 1763 all code should be reachable. So what you can see in this snippet is that you have some if condition, and then in the body of this condition, uh, we are throwing an error. However, after we throw an error, there is another throw statement. And this is strange because this another throw statement, it's not possible for it to be executed. We will always <clears throat> leave current function when the first throw is executed. So the second throw is unreachable. By the way, this, this snippet is from the Keystone uh, JS project, and this is likely likely a, a bug. <clears throat> so to be able to, to detect such issues, uh, what we do, we, we build something which is called control flow graph. So in the control flow graph, we kind of abstract away from all the control flow statements, meaning uh, for loops, if switch, and uh, all the other uh, statements which are changing the, the flow of uh, execution. And we only keep expressions in the blocks and then we keep arrows between the, the blocks. So this is another program which is kind of showing a control flow graph from, for some loop with um, if conditions. So this is testing that if x equals zero, you branch to y equals one, or you, if it's false, you invoke foo, and then you join again and you invoke bar, and then you go back to the test condition. So this, this is, uh, I mean, this, this code is really just an example. It doesn't really make concrete sense, but this is how the representation between the, behind the control flow graph looks like. And so if you, if you wanted to detect um, such, a, such a bug as I shown before, 
what we will actually do, we will traverse this control flow graph and we will be looking for a block. So, so this is another control flow graph and the difference between the previous one is that there is actually a block which is not connected to that if condition. So we will traverse the, the flow graph and we will find any block which doesn't have any entering arrow. And that would mean that that block cannot be reached uh, in any way. And so this full invocation is unreachable code and we will raise an issue there. And so unreachable code is some, sometimes called also a dead code. So that's why there is a, there is a skull next to it. Okay, so let's level up. And uh, if you want to go even deeper and to do even more sophisticated analysis, uh, we would need to go cross procedural. So in static analysis, we use the term procedural. I think this is mostly from historical reasons. So, so this means to go cross, um, so usually but in, in JavaScript, you, will, you would use the word function for, for, for the same uh, purpose. So what, what does this mean? It means the analysis between the functions. So <clears throat> for example, we have this rule 930, which is about function calls which should not pass extra arguments. So in JavaScript, actually, it's quite flexible with how many arguments you can pass to a function. And it's often used that you pass less arguments that the function is declaring because function can handle the undefined arguments by using some default values or, or something similar. However, it is rather suspicious when you are passing an argument and the function expects less arguments. So in this case, the, the, the issue which we raised on, on this uh, Strapi project, you see a function invocation with some scope argument, but the, the function which is being called doesn't declare any argument. So there is no way this scope can be used inside. So it's rather suspicious that someone would want to invoke uh, this function with, the para with, the, with this argument. It's either that the uh, parameter was forgot to be declared and there is some piece of logic missing inside this init cancel catcher or it should not be passed because it's, it's, it's confusing. Okay, and so uh, if you put all these uh, levels together, you, you reach something uh, which at least for us is somehow a, a holy grail. So this is the somehow when everything comes together and you are doing something which is usually called taint analysis which is a form of data flow analysis. So this uh, kind of analysis, it, uh, <clears throat> it's tracking uh, how the data are, is flowing through your program. So usually what you would have, uh, every time you, you have some data in your program, you have the source of data, which if we imagine, for example, um, JavaScript web application, that would be source of data would be usually the, the request object, right? So, so this is something which is sent by the, by the browser. So ultimately it is something which is coming from the user and we cannot trust the user uh, that he provides correct data. So it can be either intentionally or unintentionally somehow malicious. So this is something which we call source. And then this data is somehow flowing through through your program. So you might you might have different endpoints and you might have different functions invoking some logic. And then in the end, this data ends up uh, somewhere which we call usually a sync. So most commonly the sync would be a database or it could be a file on the file system or or something like that, something which is which is on the server and which somehow uh, we expect to, to trust it, right? So if you, if you have a database, you expect to, to trust the data which is there. So you need to make sure that on every such path, you are guaranteed that any kind of malicious or malformed data are sanitized. So you see here that, 
for example, you have one path and there is this um, square uh, which is called sanitizer. So this represents some sort of sanitization function. So you can, it can be some escaping or, or, or something similar. And then there is one path which is in, in red, which doesn't have the sanitizer. So this is the path where we would like to actually raise an issue and show to the user that, okay, there, there is a problem there because if the user provides some malicious data here, they will kind of effortlessly flow to the sink and we will keep these malicious data. We will store them in the database and we are at risk of uh, something bad happening. So I will go back to the issue that we are detecting here. So of course, if you just analyze some random projects on GitHub, as I usually do, uh, you will not find these kind of vulnerabilities every day. They are quite rare because people are like very careful not to, not to write such code. So this snippet, it's coming from OWASP uh, juice shop project. And this is intentionally vulnerable application. So I'm just going to show you how this issue looks like on one of our instances. So this is the, the project I analyzed on in Sonar Cube. So Sonar Cube is our on-premise solution. So in, in principle, it's the same engine behind as in the Sonar Cloud. Although Sonar Cube, you operate your, yourself on your side, Sonar Cloud, we operate it uh, for you. And so I analyzed this OWASP uh, Juice Shop project, and here you can see the issue which was in the presentation. And so what this is showing you is that the issue is raised here on the SQLize query statement. So if you are not familiar with SQLize, that's a database um, framework, and we are constructing a query for a database here. And what this query Tibor, is- would you zoom your browser just a little bit? Ah, thank you. Yes, sure. That's good, thank you. Okay, so so what does this what this issue does is that uh, so we raised the issue on this query statement, and here on the left you can see how the data is flowing through your application. So there are two steps, two and three, which are on the same line, so they are kind of uh, put together. But three is the invocation of the query, and two is the construction. Uh, of the of the tainted value, so this is called tainted value, into into this um, string using uh, using the template string template. So we, what we do here is that we concatenate uh, some select with request.body.email. So so this is this can be controlled by user. And uh, the first step is actually the configuration of of Express.js wrote. So this is saying that if you, in the browser, you, you reach this rest slash user slash login, uh, this login function should handle it. So you can see in the UI that this shows you in, in kind of in the one page, the full, full flow of the data through your application. So we start in the server JS, then it goes to this login, and then here you construct the query. So this is kind of simple to follow. You probably don't need this interface, but uh, in, in practice, these issues, they, they can get quite long. And uh, let's say real vulnerabilities, they, they usually consist of, of many steps. And it's kind of uh, useful to, to have this kind of use interface, which, which shows you the full flow on one page. OK. Uh, let's get back to the presentation. Okay. It's, uh, sorry. It uh, just jumped on to the beginning. So I will go here. I think I'm almost done anyway. So I will go back to our demo. Let me close this one. So as you remember, before I started with these slides, we analyzed this project on Sonar Cloud. And it's still going on. <laughs> okay, I was expecting it to be to be done already, but this is somehow uh, some. Uh, this is not always predictable because this is a, a real production instance. So it might be that there is a lot of load, and this can take a bit longer to to set up. 
and let's uh, let's maybe wait for one minute. And I think it might be useful here, Tibor, to mention that um, this does vary a little bit by time of day, but also what's happening is um, I think you're on the new beta interface. So it's analyzing not just current state of the main branch, but also the last five PRs that you would have um, if you had any PRs on this project. And so that can also add some time to the initial analysis. Yes, thank you, indeed. And okay. Maybe if there is any question to the to this first part of presentation I did so far, we can take some. So we've got a question here um, asking whether it's similar to Codacy. Uh, personally, I don't know Codacy, <laughs> um, but I, I, I heard about it, but I never tried it myself. So I, so I don't know. I've, I've done a little bit of looking at Codacy, um, and my understanding is that Codacy has possibly a comparable interface. Um, Codacy does not write their own analyzers. Codacy um, collects other analyzers, including some analyzers from SonarSource, um, and to, to cover the various languages that they offer. Um, and and uses free static analyzers to provide their service. Um, the distinction is that I believe, and I'm not going to swear to this, that Codacy is a paid service, whereas SonarCube is free for 15 popular languages, and Sonar Cloud is free for 24 languages for open source projects. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, and so indeed. Please Maybe go ahead. I, I will add a bit into that. So indeed, you, you might wonder, because in that first question, I mentioned ESLint. So actually, I, I wanted to maybe explain a bit um, how we, we also use ESLint as somehow the, the let's say, uh, engine of, of our analysis. So our analyzer for JavaScript is actually built on, on top of ESLint. And some of the issues I've shown before, they are the same as you would get with ESLint rules. However, we <clears throat> we added uh, a bunch of rules on, on, on top of that. Some of them are available as open source projects, some of the rules we added, but some of them, they are a bit more complicated and they are using some other technology uh, we developed uh, in-house. For example, the stained analysis is, is, is a good example of that. So those, are not really available anywhere else. So I think that answers the, the next question that came in, which is, uh, says we already have TypeScript and ESLint on our project. What could Sonar, Sonar Source um, provide in addition that's not already provided by TypeScript and ESLint? And I, I guess that answers it unless you want to add anything else? Yes, exactly. So on top of ESLint, we, we, we built uh, our, our rules and especially the stand analysis, which is doing a bit more advanced analysis for security issues. And so oh, does it, yes. Sorry, the, we have a follow-up question from Nikolai who said, what are the advantages to writing your own analyzers? Um, in addition to what you've mentioned, which is you know going above and beyond, um, I wanna mention that um, at SonarSource, we do have experience with aggregating other people's analyzers. Uh, a thousand years ago, we did that when we first launched. And um, what we found was that we became the middlemen when people had questions, bugs, feature requests. So all we could do was say, we'll talk to the guy that wrote the analyzer versus being able to actually deal with the problem, being able to fix the bug, improve the rule, et cetera. So hopefully that answers that. Okay, uh, Strapi somehow resists uh, to, to get analyzed. Um, so I will go a bit um, further and I will show you one uh, of our website, which is called rules.sonarsource.com. 
So this is somehow our database of all the different rules we have. So as I mentioned before, a rule is um, basically a, a static and a piece of static analysis, which is checking a particular pattern in the code. So here, so this database is for all the languages. So if you select JavaScript, we have something like 250 rules. And here I filtered the, the injection rules. So, so these rules are often, uh, are mostly, most of them are based on this uh, taint analysis technique I was showing before. And uh, you can find usual suspects here, like the, the most uh, kind of uh, common vulnerabilities as such as I was showing before, the database queries should not be vulnerable. Or uh, for example, another thing is operating system commands should not be vulner vulnerable to, to injection attacks and, and similar. So this is kind of database of all the rules. Also what we have inside Sonar Cloud and here is a description. So if the issue is, uh, if the issue is raised, you can actually read, I can show that here on this issue I was showing before, you can actually read what the issue is about and so, so you have this, why is this an issue? And here is a, here is a piece of text explaining why, why, the, why this piece of code is problematic. Here is an example showing like uh, some kind of bad pattern which you should not do. And here is also an example how this should be sanitized. So in case of database injection, usually the most common way to, to deal with that is actually to use the parameterized queries. So the place where the data is to be inserted is, is these question marks and then you provide you provide arguments to the to the query invocation. And that way the framework or the library you are using will will kind of deal uh, with the problem for you. Okay, let's give one last chance to Strapi to get analyzed and it managed. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so after you analyze the projects, this is what you, you what you will see. So there are some things which are not fully configured, but I will not go to that now. But here you will have these uh, two columns with three rows. It will show you the the different categories of issues which were detected. So we have the reliability issues, which usually you would call that bugs. And then we have maintainability issues, uh, which we call cold smells. And you have vulnerabilities, uh, which are issues which we probably really want to look at. And then you have something which we call security hotspot. So this is not strictly a vulnerability, it's just that there is some sensitive part of your code, for example, of database access or, or, or something similar, which you want to keep an eye on. Okay, so as you see, there, there, there are quite some many. So there are something like 1.4K 1, 1. Uh, code smells. And you might wonder like, wow, that's, I, I don't want to review that. Like that's, that's too much to review. And you should not. And that's the kind of important thing that you should, you should probably look if you have any vulnerabilities, but you can kind of ignore those, uh, those thousands of issues which are detected. And I will explain that in a minute. Let's first check this vulnerability here. So this is this open source Strapi project, which is public on GitHub. And if you find a vulnerability here, that's, that's really important. So let's check it out. And this is some JSON web token call. And actually it would be quite unlikely to detect vulnerability in, in such a project just like that. So this is actually something which is called false positive. So this issue is raised, but it's not a real issue uh, because uh, it's saying that the algorithm for encryption of the JSON web token is not configured. Although if you pass uh, empty object, it will use a default algorithm, which is safe. So you can just ignore this issue and the way to actually ignore the issue, and this is maybe a bit different to what other static analysis tools would offer to you that you actually can manage this issue. So what you can do here is you can mark this as false positive and you can provide like so short explanation for your colleagues that default is actually 
safe. So you might wonder why I'm presenting you this bug in our static analyzer. <laughs> Because I, I, I wanted this demo to be somehow real. And also, we, we already fixed this problem. So I think it will soon disappear. So let me comment this out. Now, if I go back to my summary page, this will actually displace you all. OK, let's do something more interesting. Uh, zoom just a little bit, Tibor. Zoom out or in? In, zoom the browser. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thank you. OK. So I will switch to, to the console, and I'm going to create a PR to this project. So first, I'm, I will create a branch. And this branch will be called uh, demo. And I will open this in my editor. And I'm going to add a file in the root of the file system. So I'm not actually adding anything to the Strapi itself. I don't actually understand how Strapi works very much. But I will just add JavaScript file to the root of the repository. And I will copy paste in some piece of code, which I know that it's vulnerable. So I'm going to save that. Switch back to console. So this is the file I edit. So I edit to my index. I commit it. And I will push this to GitHub. So after I push this to GitHub, I, I am going to open a pull request. Now I need to be careful not to push this to upstream project. It happened to me when I was preparing this presentation. I, I think they were not very happy with my contribution. Uh, OK, so I am adding this, this one file with this short code snippet. So, so what, this, what this code is doing, I, I'm going to zoom again a bit. So, so this is very simple Express application. So this is Express router configuration. And the function is calling send file with the with something from the request so if you don't know express uh, this is just some bad code if you know express you probably understand why this is bad okay so i'm going to create this pull request so what's going to happen on sonar cloud is that here after i refresh it will discover that there is a pull request going on, and it will automatically start an analysis on this pull request. So this will take a minute, but hopefully not so much as the first analysis <laughs> did. Uh, if there are any questions, I, I can take maybe one or two. So we've had a couple questions in the chat um, that Yasin answered. And as a reminder, there's a separate Q&A function. So please do put your questions there. Um, one of the questions was um, asking for a link to find uh, the rules. Um, and I think Yasin pointed them to that. Um, and, and, and Yasin also pointed out that we do analyze React, Vue, and Angular projects. But no other questions right now. OK. So while, while this is happening, uh, I will talk a little bit about VS Code. Uh, so as you might have seen, in VS Code, uh, I have an extension installed, which is called SonarLint. So, so this is one of our companion projects. So, so this is the VS Code extension. Um, we have the same extension for also for other editors, but I will focus on VS Code here. So if you install this in your project, it will provide you the same kind of analysis as I was showing before. So if I write the piece of code I, I had in the presentation before, so that I have the if statement. I'm not sure if I can zoom this one. Ah, yes, 
Okay, so that's maybe better. So this is the extension, it's called Sonar Lint. I already have it installed. So you have right the piece of code that, which was in the presentation earlier, earlier sorry. <laughs> uh, you will see that it's immediately highlighted with this yellow wiggly line. And if I hover about it, you would find that there is this message, the same one as, as Sonar Cloud slash Sonar Cube can raise, which is about uh, you should remove this conditional structure or edit the branches so they are not all the same. And you have the, the number of the rule which raised this. So this is like Sonar Lint extension, and then there is JavaScript colon and the rule number. And if you click on this view problem, it shows this thing. And if you click on the quick fix, it allows you to open the descriptions. And this opens the panel on the side. And you have the same description as I was showing earlier on this rules.sonarsource.com page, but you have it inside the Visual Studio code. OK. So uh, let's check again how is our OK, somebody added another PR there. Interesting. <laughs> OK. OK, while this is happening, I will show you another uh, demo. And uh, let's uh, switch context a bit. So. Uh, I will show you another project, which is called ESLint plugin Sonar.js. And this is the, so we, we, we took some of our rules and we created an ESLint plugin. So if you are already like very much entrenched with, with ESLint, you can use this plugin uh, to have some of, our, uh, some of the rules we, we developed. But obviously you will not get all of them and you will not get all this nice integration we, we, we have. And I'm just going, I, so I choose, I, I picked this project because I, I wanted to, to analyze it. And I, I will just show you how you can analyze this project using GitHub Actions. So this time I will set up the projects a bit differently. I will not use this automatic analysis for which we, we are waiting way too long. Uh, here, <laughs> but I will use GitHub Actions to, to execute the analysis and I will push the result of analysis to Sonar Cloud. So this way you can set up any sort of CI you are using. So if you, if you are using some on-premise uh, continuous integration service, you can integrate with that. Or if you are using GitHub Actions or Travis or Circle CI, whatever. Okay, so I will again go to Sonar Cloud and my projects, sorry. And I'm going to add a new project. And this time I will not start here because this will trigger automatic analysis, but I will click on the link here to create the project manually. So I will again choose my personal organization and I'm gonna choose a project name so you can see some values when I was testing this presentation. So we are going to pick a next one. <clears throat> okay, and I click on setup. So now it will show me uh, different CI services. So we have direct integration with GitHub Actions and with Travis CI, but you can do the same thing with other CI tools. So I'm going to choose the GitHub Actions. So first, what it's going to ask me to do is to create secret in my repository. So the secret of uh, I will, is named uh, sonar underscore token. And so I will go to settings in my repository, secrets, and I already created it when I was preparing this, so I forgot to remove it. Okay, so it's, it's this secret. I will just update it. So you would click here on new repository secret or you know what, let me remove it. Okay, I'm gonna remove it. So this is how it would be if you are really starting from scratch. Okay, so we will add new repository secret. The name is sonar underscore token. 
the value I'm gonna copy paste from here and I will add a secret. Okay, secret edit. Let's continue. So now it's going to ask me to create the GitHub workflow YAML file. So if you are not familiar with GitHub Actions, this is a bit of configuration for GitHub Actions to actually like see what should be executed. And it's asking me, what is my project about? So we have different setup for Java projects, Maven Gradle, then for .NET. We are in JavaScript, so we fall under this. Okay, so it's asking me to create this kind of workflow. So what this workflow does that on every push to GitHub on master branch or pull request, you should execute this Sonar Cloud action. And it has following steps. So first it will check out the repository and then it will run the scan. And it's using the, the GitHub token secret. So this secret is implicitly provided by GitHub on the repository. And then it's using the, the secret which we just created. So these secrets are used to authenticate between Sonar Cloud and GitHub. Okay, so I will switch to my editor. I already have the, oh, sorry, I will just take some water. So this is the Strapi project. I already have the, the project um, checked out here. So I will just open it in the editor. So this is the project where we are going to add the, the workflow. So the workflows should be added in this .github directory. I will create a new folder called workflows here. And here I will create a new workflow which is called build.yaml. Okay. And so I can just copy paste this one. So this will execute the, the scan without doing nothing. But actually, uh, I want to also build this project and I want to run the, the tests. So what I will do here, I will add some additional steps before I execute the, the Sonar Cloud scan. I'm just going to copy paste because I prepared it before. So what I want to do is I want to set up the node and then I want to run the tests with coverage. Okay, so setup node uh, with version 12. Okay, run yarn build, run yarn test with coverage. Okay, I'm gonna save this. And let's see what's the next step in setting up the project manually. Okay, so we did this second step with setting the workflow uh, for GitHub action. And next, I need to configure my analysis. So usually this is done by putting the sonar-project.properties file into your source repository. Okay, sorry, I have a lot of windows open. Uh, I'm going to create sonar.project uh, sonar projectproperties file here. And here I can put some analysis parameters I want to be used for, for this. So I have the file here already prepared, so I don't need to type it out. I will just change few things. Okay, so most important is the project key. So it's number four now. This is my organization project description, this is not mandatory. Then I configure the, the directory with sources. So this project is structured such that you have SR, R, S, SRC directory and test directory. So I just configure what are the sources, what are the tests. And I will explain later what's the purpose of this. And then this is the, the, the probably the most important part. So I, I will configure where is my coverage report. So the coverage report when you are using Jest, we are using Jest in this project. It's in this Elco format. So this is a format we support. And then there is this also test execution report. 
which is basically just saying like which tests were executed, which failed and which, which succeeded. Okay, so I am adding these two files to my repository. And let me see. Okay, so we have this GitHub workflow file and Sonar project properties. I'm gonna add both of them to the commit. So there is this build YAML and Sonar project properties and I will just commit them. So this will be add Sonar cloud analysis. Okay, I'm just doing this on master branch because I'm so rich, but uh, you would probably do it on the on, on, on some some other. Okay, so I'm going to push this. Uh, let me just check here. Yes, this was the last step we needed to do to configure this. Okay, so I'm just going to push this and let's see what happens in this project. So let's get back to this repository. Okay, actions, and I have the actions executed. So this is running GitHub action and it will soon start, hopefully. Da -di -da -di -da. Okay, maybe we can take some question if there is any. <laughs> so while we're waiting for that, Tibor, um, we did have a question in the Q&A uh, asking whether Sonar Cloud is HIPAA compliant or whether it's possible to sign a BAA. I'm not sure what a BAA is, but I just want to point out that HIPAA is about protecting um, patient information and presumably you're not going to have any patient information in your code. So I'm not certain that it would be relevant. Um, probably Sonar Cloud is not HIPAA compliant, but you do have the same underlying analysis in Sonar Cube, which runs on premise. So if security is an issue for you, if you need to tightly control uh, what's going on with your code, then maybe instead of Sonar Cloud, you would use Sonar Cube. And also, I would add that if if you are asking such question, you are probably thinking about using it in some, let's say, more serious environment. So I would really recommend to, to reach out to our salespeople and they will they will surely answer with, with certainty uh, what's what's the best uh, way to, to go forward. That's a great point. We have um, <laughs> consultants who who, hand, who who professionally answer this particular type of question rather than... Yeah, so... Okay, it started to run. Um, it took a bit longer than usual. Okay, so now this is executing the Sonar Cloud GitHub action. It will also execute the, the build and uh, coverage I edit uh, to this build step. Okay, so now it's checking out the, the repository and starting the node container and now we are running the the build so this project is in is, is in trice typescript so this is running a typescript compilation okay there are some warnings we should check maybe later and now it's running typescript okay i'm gonna zoom in again because i think it's resets every time okay and now we are executing the tests with coverage So hopefully all of them will pass. They should have. I didn't modify anything, so <laughs> it should still be green. Okay, all tests passed. We have the coverage and now we are starting the Sonar Cloud Scan. So while I'm looking at this, I'm thinking that maybe the order of steps is not the optimal one, but it should not matter actually. So while we're waiting for that to finish, Tibor, um, we've got another question. Does uh, Sonar Lint in the IDE use cloud for analysis or does it work without internet? Okay, so uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, so it, it, the analysis uh, Sonar Lint is doing is run locally. 
so you, you don't need to be connected to any service. You just install the extension and you are completely offline and all the analysis is done offline. However, you have the option to connect it to Sonar Cloud or on-premise Sonar Cube. This is something which we call connected mode. You can configure that in your settings. And what that gives you is that you always have up-to-date analyzers. So it will use the same version of the analyzer which is used on, on Sonar Cloud. And the, the reason for that is that we are fixing issues, we are adding new rules. So you always want to have the same setting you are using in your continuous integration and which you are using locally. Otherwise, you can have some discrepancies between the two. So it might be that locally, you would have some issue which is false positive, which was already fixed and deploy, uh, and the fix is already on Sonar Cloud. So you won't always want to run like the, the latest analyzer to have the, the latest uh, version of the analysis available. So that's one reason to, to use this connected mode. The second reason to use this connected mode, as you've seen earlier, I, I marked this issue as, as false positive. So this was also reflect in your code editor. So if someone marks the issue as a false positive, you can actually benefit from that work of triaging the, the issues and the issue will, will disappear from your editor <clears throat> when you are in the connected mode. So you can be fully offline if you wish to, and you can connect to Sonar Cloud uh, if you want to, to have some, some benefits uh, by doing that. Also, the final little remark, uh, this taint analysis, which I was mentioning before, like this more advanced uh, analysis, this one is not executed locally in SonarLint. And it's not that it's computed on the cloud usually, it's just that SonarLint extension cannot do that uh, by itself uh, as of now. So what SonarLint does that if you have such Taint, um, such an such a issue from such a rule, it will display it only if you are connected to the Sonar Cloud. OK, let's switch back. OK, so this has finished the Sonar Cloud scan. So one way to, to open it, OK, so I could go directly to Sonar Cloud to the project, or here in the logs, you will find this kind of analysis successful line with, with a hyperlink going here. So one thing why I wanted to show this GitHub Actions demo is that this gives you better opportunity to control the parameters of the analysis and it allows you more options that, than this automatic way. So automatic way is perfect for smaller projects or quick setup and it's really nice. It really works quite well. There is like very little configuration you need to do. But if you are using uh, your own CI, you can execute tests and you can execute coverage for your test. And we will display that information. So here, this is one of our projects, a little bit of self-promotion. So this is because we are writing these tools, we actually also use them. So you see that the, the, uh, there are almost no issues and coverage is quite high because uh, we really care to have very high coverage in our projects. So this is this is showing you the, the test coverage. And here, if I open any file, so these files are sorted by um, ascending coverage. So this file is the least covered one. And if I open it, I here I have this um, gutter with color coded things. So this, this is fully covered by tests. Here is some branch miss missing and this return is not executed. And it has, it also shows you like um, the information for GitHub. So you know who is the author when it was committed and you have the SHA-1 for the commit. So one reason why you would want to use GitHub Actions, for example, instead of uh, this automatic analysis I used for Strapi is that you would like to have coverage displayed. Otherwise there are almost equivalent. Okay. So Tibor, if I'm using GitHub Actions, do I have to set up Jenkins too? No, no, no. You, you either use GitHub Actions or Jenkins. You would not use both probably. 
So GitHub Actions is my CI CD. Yes, GitHub Actions is like, yeah, CI CD. Yes, exactly. Okay, so I will close this ES Lint plugin with GitHub Actions project. Sorry that I'm kind of interleaving my demos. I just want to optimize uh, the waiting time. Okay, so this PR on Strapi is analyzed. So just to recap a bit. So we did analyze the main branch of this Strapi and we had these many bugs and many code smells here. There was also this one vulnerability, which was about JSON web tokens, which, which, which I closed. And some duplications are computed. Coverage is not computed because we didn't execute the test. So we actually don't know the coverage by the test. So if I open the pull request, I really would like to know who is adding these PRs here, but okay. So I we analyze this pull request here. And just to remind this pull request was about me adding to the root of the project, one vulnerable file. So as you can see, here, all the bugs are at zero. The security reviews is at zero. And there is one code smell, one vulnerability. So if I open the vulnerability, this is the vulnerability I added in my PR. And Sonar Cloud is smart enough to not show you issues which are in the main branch, but show you the issues which are only in your PR. So it's doing some sort of diff. So you are only dealing with the things you edit. To, to you are going to add to the code base. So this is kind of following a, a scout rule. So you leave the place in a better shape that you found it and you are not adding more to, to technical debt. So if I open this issue, it will show me the code and it will just show me that indeed I am getting the, the user data and I'm, I'm doing some, some dangerous operations. So I should probably fix this. And also one thing I wanted to add. So if I go back to GitHub and I open this pull request. So this is the pull request I created. And here, Sonar Cloud. So there is also kind of like bi-directional connection. So not only GitHub is pushing data to Sonar Cloud and you can check your issues in Sonar Cloud, but also Sonar Cloud will comment on your PR with such a small summary to show you how your PR is doing. So it's showing us that there is this one vulnerability and I have the option to click on this and it gives me, gives me, gives, go, it redirects me back to this interface. Okay. So that would be probably all for the demos. If I didn't forget something. So we had a, another poll uh, we wanted to ask. So let's maybe have this poll quickly. So this poll was about this extension in your editor. So do you use a static analysis extension in your, in your editor? Please vote quickly. So I've opened the poll. We've got votes coming in already. And maybe while people are voting, if there is any question, I can answer the question. So we've got a question, is the PR blocked from Sonar Cloud? So I think they're asking about um, the checks. Is George ah. blocked? Yes. OK, indeed. So I didn't go into the detail. So in Sonar Cloud, what we have is this concept of quality gate. So this is some, some sort of a gate, which is either green or red, depending on if you failed or not. So you can, so there is some default uh, configuration. By default configuration, you cannot have any vulnerability there. So here the quality gate has failed. And this information is pushed back to, to GitHub. And it will actually say that some checks has failed. And one of the checks which has failed is this Sonar Cloud code analysis. So then depending on, on how you configure your repository, there is a setting uh, which, which checks uh, for branches are required to be there. Okay, I, I did not configure this here, but I believe there is such reals. Yes, so there is this required status checks to pass before merging and I can check the Sonar Cloud code analysis 
And if I do this, okay, it's going to ask me for password. Um, okay. Uh, I will just quickly. Tak. So, so indeed, I require status check to pass Sonar Cloud. So if I configure this, it will actually prevent me to merge my branch if Sonar Cloud analysis failed. So this can be made optional or not, how you wish. But the Sonar Cloud will create a check uh, on the PR and you have, a, you have a way to configure if this is kind of a blocker or not. I hope that answers the question. I, I think it probably does. So meanwhile, I think probably everyone who's gonna vote has voted in the poll, so I'm gonna end the polling. Um, we've had 58% say they use ESLint, 24% use SonarLint. Um, we've got one person using another tool. Please do tell us what you're using in the Discord room. Um, and three who aren't yet using SonarLint, but hopefully we'll start tomorrow, today. Perfect. Okay. So, unless there are some more questions, I'm going to wrap up. So thank you everyone for, for your attendance. Uh, thank Anne for helping me with uh, moderation. And hopefully I, I convince you to, to use the static analysis. Thank you. Also, thank you, we, will, we will hang out in the, in the room uh, for a while. So if you have any additional questions, you can reach out there. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.